Hello, everyone. Welcome to Female Genital Mutilation in the U.S., a call for action. I became interested in FGM as part of my graduate education, and after that, I have attended so many different events, and in all of them, uh, a lot of people repeatedly said that because FGM is not mandated in the Quran or the Bible or any other religious text, it has nothing to do with the practice of religions. Later, I have had the opportunity to be involved with American Atheists, and as part of my job as a law clerk, I have been tracking a legislative initiative this year, so uh, I was able to approach the topic from another perspective. Today, I have two purposes. First, to dispel the misconception that FGM is an African problem, and secondly, that you live today with the absolute certainty that secular approach to FGM is the only way to end it. This presentation has three parts. First will be a, an introduction and a little bit of explaining what is FGM or cutting, uh, its types, uh, and a little bit of how FGM is seen worldwide. Secondly, I will provide an overview of FGM in the US, the legislative uh, laws uh, in, in A and A, 2019 effective efforts to end this practice, and a little bit of our work at American Atheists, and finally, a little bit of information how you can get involved. Uh, the first thing I, you need to know is that FGM is defined as all procedures that involve partial or total removal of external female genitalia or other injuries of female genital organs for non-medical reasons. This, part, the la this last part about the medical reasons is really important because in our legislation we have some exceptions for procedures that could be interpreted as FGM. I spent a lot of time looking for the appropriate a slide to show you the different types of FGM so you don't have to leave the room. <laughs> um, but I encourage you to keep your eyes open and to play a game with me. I don't think the approach of putting yourself in other people's shoes, depending um, in this exercise, is like really accurate. So for the male audience, I will need you to think and feel that people are doing this to your best friend, so you can help us in the feeling. Here comes the slides. As you can see, FGM has been categorized in, different, in four different practices. Type one, often referred as clitoridectomy, is the partial or total removal of the clitoris, in, and in rare cases, only the fold of skin surrounded the clitoris. Type two is called excision, and is the partial or total removal of the clitoris and the labia minora with or without the excision of the labia majora. Type three is called infibulation, which is the narrowing of the vaginal opening through the creation of a covering seal formed by cutting and repositioning the levia majora or minora, sometimes through stitching, with or without the removal of the clitoris. What you are seeing here in type three is not an exaggeration. It's not that the slide looks weird. In reality, the hole can be as little as the diameter of a drinking straw. Imagine the consequences of that. Type four is all other harmful procedures to the female genitalia for non-medical purpose, and it includes pricking, incising, and cauterizing the genital area. Now you can breathe. Again, you can lose your ties a little bit. <laughs> 
I won't say much about the psychological and physical effects of the FGM because I don't have a lot of time, but keep in mind that increased low self-esteem, infections, urinary problems, menstruation problems, and even birth complications. The bad news about FGM is that it's practiced almost in every country, continent. Worldwide, FGM looks like this. According to the World Health Organization, at least 200 million women have been cut. And believe it or not, this was the best map I could find, although it doesn't include any data regarding Iraq, and my native country, Colombia. In Colombia, FGM is performed by indigenous tribes, specifically the indigenous NASA and Embera. And among all those communities, gathering data is even more difficult than in the US. Although researchers agree that between the Embera community, two out of three uh, women have been cut. They also agree that apparently this practice came for, from a black Muslim, from ba black Muslim uh, slaves from Mali in the 18th century. In Asia and Africa, FGM looked like this. In Asia, the practice involves countries like, like Indonesia or Singapore, while in others as Malaysia has been reported that 93% of girls have undergone FGM. Regarding Africa, this is the most common uh, map you can find when you research this topic. But don't get, don't get that fooled you. This map only represents a region in the world with a high number of survivors, but FGM is everywhere. Uh, in Africa also, people try to think that it's related exclusively to Islam, and even though it's practiced in countries as like Egypt and Iraq, it, it is also practiced in Christian countries as Ethiopia and Eritrea. But all of these communities have something in common. All of them believe that FGM could be practiced as a matter of tradition and that is, it, it enhances uh, virginity and chastity and even the possibility of motherhood. Sometimes even they are often related to the fact that guys only marry women who have undergone FGM. Regarding the US, the first thing you need to know is that according to the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, approximately half a million women and girls in the US are at risk. This number is the result of indirect, indirect sources because we don't have a national or federal survey gathering this information. This means that in reality, the number could be way higher, and probably is. This situation uh, has doubled, FGM has doubled in the past decade, but for girls younger than 18, it has quadrupled since 1990. And contrary to common beliefs, this practice affects American citizens, especially second generation Americans. Hopefully, uh, no, in a positive way, the U.S. Code contemplates FGM as a crime since 1996. It states the definition, it provides some exceptions to the practice um, that cannot be performed on minors. It also uh, prohibits traveling with minors in order to perform FGM in other states, but it was only until last year, 2018, that a federal court in Michigan decided the first case. This is the case, um, United States versus Nagarwala. 
in which eight defendants were charged with female genital mutilation and conspiracy. These charges include Dr. Nagarwala, who was the practitioner, Dr. Attar, who owns a clinic in Michigan in which the, the cutting was performed, two people who had uh, helped the practitioner, and four mothers of the survivors. This case is long, and I will be happy to discuss all the details with you, and obviously it's more compli complex of, to what I can say right now, but basically uh, the judge ruled that Congress lacked authority to enact the statute prohibiting FGM under the Commerce Clause, because being caught has nothing to do with interstate commerce. Not surprisingly, the case didn't mention religion or, pra or cultural, culture or tradition, uh, which in my opinion is an important part of um, overall understanding about FGM. Um, in fact, it only mentioned the word religion three times and in two of those times are referring to international statutes. In addition, it didn't mention that the practitioners are part of a community, part of the Shia Islam, who do perform FGM as a religious practice. The case will be still hearing in the, in the counts regarding conspiracy, but last week, the Department of Justice um, stated that they won't pursue or, and they won't appeal the, decision, the judge decision regarding the FGM charges because the, the law is too weak. It, the, it needs to be rewritten in order for them to perform a better job. By calling the constitutionality of this federal statute, we are facing at least two problems. One, we are fighting a discourse that don't want to go into details of what is FGM and all the sense that we are talking about a, something bigger than humans and humans cannot fully comprehend or analyze and way less to solve. Also, uh, they are we are in this narrative of dismissing the allegation of FGM that doesn't involve a direct uh, relationship with this sacred text. Secondly, we are in a situation that states need to take a step forward and start working on those issues. And that is what we have seen in American Asia's in this past legislation period. And this is a screenshot of the tracking system we use. We are currently tracking more than six, no more. At this point is not 69 uh, bills around the country regarding cutting in more than 25 states. But keep in mind, please, that this is only one topic. We track so many topics so that around 500 bills in this legislative period. Some of these bills use the same language as this, the federal statute, provide a definition, create some exceptions, and uh, trying to increase the penalties from five years to 20. Only 21 states in the U.S. have enacted legislation prohibited FGM. And I'm using in, in a study you know, organized by the Ahayang Hirsi Ali Foundation, and you can see that states in a darker color have a letter A, in which that will mean that probably the state enacted a law uh, creating FGM as a felony and not as a misdemeanor, but also increasing the number of years in prison or allowing the prosecution not only of practitioners, but also parents and other people involved in taking care of minors. On the other hand, states with letter D will be those that don't create any civil procedure for survivors 
or doesn't uh, advance education on this topic, or outlaw a practice called vacation cutting, what is a def is the term they use to refer to the fact of taking girls uh, out of the country most of the time during the school year or certain holidays or spring break to have the procedure in other countries and come back and still have time to heal. Ohio looked like this. Ohio has a grade, grade of B, but it has more than 24,000 women and girls at risk. Um, however, Ohio has a legislation at that moment. I want to highlight that the bill, uh, the bill came into effect only less than a month ago. That was March 28, 2019. The bill was passed in December, um, so it's pretty new. It's, I will say it's a good legislation, but still has some way to improve it by prosecuting not only practitioners, but parents, our guardians, and creating education and outreach programs. And guess what? American atheists participated in the legislative period, and we provide a testimony for this bill, and this is a, how our testimonies looks like. Um, yep. <laughs> We wrote in behalf of our 1,200 members in this state. Uh, we applaud the legislation they were trying to pass. Um, uh, I will say that I'm pretty um, proud of the language we use and how we present uh, to our uh, the committees that they are discuss that are discussing these issues because. We point out what is wrong with the bill. We use, if we have to say the word religion or uh, being clear about what is going on, so we use the right language and we explain what we do, our nature, and we are an we are we are unapologetic about our position and how the non-believer community feels regarding FGM. A second testimony I want to show you is a failed bill. Oh, no. The bill hasn't passed in Washington, Washington State, and American atheists took a different position there because we understand that they are trying to improve, but in this specific bill, they only want to um, create actions for licensed practitioners. But in reality, the FGM is practiced for people that are in license. So we recommended an amendment, including all this information, creating FGM as a felony, and prosecuting individuals, and implementing education, and so on. We still have a lot of work to do because a model legislation will look like this. It will increase the sentencing period for, from five years to 20 years. It will move in the burden of proving the, the violation from survivors to investigators. We'll adapt a tracking system to see what are the situation, in which situation we are and what are the real numbers. It will also extend the statute of limitation of civil and criminal actions. It will introduce education panels to inform people about the risk associated with FGM. It will address the roots of the problem, that we are missing that conversation. I would like you to be aware of the discourse we, ha we are hearing these days and how that shapes the way we approach FGM. Stay away from the apologetic people who pretends to put this conversation in another level and tell us that it's, we are not ready, we are too, too impatient, we have to give people time to realize that the practice is wrong. Uh, I think 
On the contrary, we need to keep calling things by their name. We need to be bold enough to use the right language. Uh, if it's a religious practice, we have to say it and be critical about it. If it's not, being fair also. Like, and don't let the circumstances happen, like, like what happened in Michigan, they didn't mention the, the practice and the relationship with the defendants. Other people use euphemism, so don't go in that direction. I think we are ready and we have to have the discussion and have the, all the support we, ha we can. And I think in this particular sense is why American atheist work is so important. We aren't attacking Islam or Christianity. We attack all, absolutely all, laws and discrimination and cultural practice that pretend to cut uh, rights to women and girls of, in the United States. Other way that you can uh, have a better approach of this, if you pay attention, I never use the word victim. I think it's really important to start empowering survivors and let them to speak about it and create platforms for them to tell the story. <laughs> yeah. Regarding American atheists, I will say that we have written around 12 testimonies this year only for this topic. We have different action alerts. You can call your representative. You can become a member and read the testimonies we do. We write in state committees. You don't have to do anything. That is a good part. I do everything. I do all the research. I draft the testimony. My boss, Allison, take a look at that. And you only have to go there and put a pretty face or, and a serious face because this is a serious topic and let people know what we think about it. Um, I think that is the only way, being active about what we care and being unapologetic about what we do is the only way that we can defeat female genital mutilation in the U.S. Thanks. Yeah, I have four minutes for questions. Female genital mutilation. Nope. Yes. Thank you very much for that presentation and for all the work that you're doing to end FGM. I am familiar with the, uh, the case in Michigan because I live in Detroit, um, but I'm also wondering and concerned about that there's no mention here of the practice of male circumcision, which is also a religious practice, and I'm wondering if American Atheist is willing to take that on, given that it endangers a million baby boys every year in the United States. Yeah, sure. I was... I did embed because I'm terrible at that, but that was one of the, someone told me that probably someone will say any, something about female, uh, male circumcision. And I, I completely agree. Doing the research, uh, I often find people talking about the, both practices and differentiate them in, in a very weird way. I think you have to be really good at logic gymnastic in order to separate both of them. Uh, and I would be happy to talk to you more about it, but yeah, I didn't want to mention female, uh, male circumcision on purpose. <laughs> All right, we have a question here in the back. So in your legislation, who would be opposed to this in legislatures? I mean, what are, the, what are their arguments against it? What we have seen is what, the same that happened in, in the child marriage, with the child marriage topic and the speaker, the problems she was mentioning, that the 
People are too afraid to go against those practices, especially because no one will say, yeah, I will take my kids and have these practice overseas or in, in other states. So it's, it's kind of complicated because obviously people are in outspoken about it and they are in open, but for the legislative period, for Congress people and and in the House, what we have seen is they don't want to be too controversial. They don't want to uh, single out religion as the cause of FGM, so they use a cultural and tradition, and that gets a little bit more difficult to attack, I will say. Yeah, we have time for one question over here in the back. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I admit I'm not a lawyer, but I understand that the Commerce Clause, which is to regulate commerce between the states and between the United States and foreign governments, since it, they may not, the, the, the law may not be able to be constitutional if somebody just goes down the block to have this procedure done, but I understand there are people going across state lines to go to sympathetic, uh, and as you say, vacation tourism, when they take the girl back to the old country, why didn't they carve out this thing, which to me would seem would not violate the Commerce Clause? Would be something that the United States government could legally, I guess maybe you, it's just thought I had. That, that is a good question. The, the case died, I will say, or this, this count died in summary judgment, which is an earlier state in the process. So the decision itself doesn't mean, I will say it takes a more legalistic approach, so it doesn't go into the whole details of what FGM implies. They even say that it isn't a transaction. So no one receives money or, um, so it doesn't have anything to do with, with money or commerce. They also say that um, because it doesn't happen frequently, I don't know, you don't have millions of people doing that, it doesn't affect the economy. Uh, they also tackle other arguments, especially regarding international law, but the U.S. hasn't ratified any of the international treaties, so <laughs> that was a little more difficult. Thank you so much. Thank you.